Well, thank you very much. Uh, it really is a pleasure to, to be here. Uh, I, I think I'm always supposed to say half a day when I, when I arrive in Guam, so let me say half a day to everybody. Um, I've already learned something, I have to say, as I just watched the first uh, half hour, 40 minutes of this. Um, I used to organize conferences in Washington some. I know how difficult it is. This is an extraordinary conference. Uh, but I've never started a conference with a national anthem. Um, and with, uh, I saw the Guam anthem, the Guam hymn as well. I have to say that that struck me very, very personally as far as um, the, the patriotism and the commitment of people here in Guam, of course, not only to the United States, that's uh, represented by the national anthem, but to the Guam anthem, which tells me a lot about the great pride here. That, that really made a, an impact on me, and maybe it's n natural for you to see. But I think um, from the comments we've already seen here, about how you want to see change, um, a constructive change as we move forward. I think we have to take back to Washington the need to retain uh, what you have here, which is quite special. Um, I want to extend uh, my thanks uh, to uh, Dr. Underwood from the U University of Guam for, uh, for the invitation to join you this morning. This really is an extraordinary and important uh, meeting. Uh, I also want to uh, extend my uh, warm uh, appreciation and acknowledge Governor Camacho for his leadership, his leadership not only here on Guam uh, and his partnership, uh, but also his partnership back in D.C. with the Department of Defense, with the different uh, resource agencies in Washington and your brother and sister nations um, across the Pacific Island region. I also, even though she can only be here by DVD, I want to uh, recognize Congresswoman Bordalio for her leadership in Washington on Guam's behalf as well. I don't know what legislators are here. I, I was here about two months ago and met with a round table of legislators over lunch. That was a memorable experience uh, and very useful to hear the frank views of, of the local legislators. And I say that honestly. It was very, very important for me to, to meet them. I don't, I don't know if, uh, who's here, but I do want to uh, extend my appreciation to them. Um, and I want, also want to say during my first visit here, uh, I was fortunate to have uh, Mr. John uh, Jackson and the staff of JIGPO, the Joint Guam Program Office, as my guide. Admiral Beazel, I saw, and others, uh, they were tremendous in helping me understand what's happening here. And I did a, a complete tour of the island and saw firsthand uh, from the different bases, et cetera, what is, what is happening uh, uh, here in Guam. Um, now, I really appreciated the, the opportunity to uh, come here. When I saw Dr. Underwood uh, uh, two months back, he mentioned this conference, and he said what's very, very important is to give the people of Guam a better context for understanding where they are in the context of U.S. strategy. We, we say it sort of offhandedly, Guam is going to be very important, uh, but it's not really spelled out exactly uh, why. So I'm, I'm here to do really three things. Uh, one is to provide that uh, broader strategic context. Uh, discuss America's, first of all, America's strategic purpose in the Asia-Pacific region. Secondly, discuss the details and the guiding principles of the realignment plan as part of that strategy, including Guam's place in, in U.S. strategy, and then provide a status update on how we in Washington are proceeding with implementation of that plan. I think you heard from the, the previous two speakers a lot of those details. I don't have to go through them, and in fact, I think uh, you over the next day are going to be talking about a lot of those elements of implementation, but I'll make a few comments from Washington's perspective. So first, let me just talk about um, America's strategic purpose in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, as Secretary Gates, my Secretary uh, uh, Gates in defense has said, Asia has become the center of gravity in a rapidly globalizing world. And I don't think that comes as any surprise to anybody who's watching Asia. This is long in coming and not unforeseen. Uh, but let me give you a few statistics to give you a sense of context. I know it's tough to get statistics at 9 in the morning, but a few things, just a few statistics, are very useful. Uh, the region, the Asia-Pacific region as we define it, encompasses over half of the Earth's surface, includes 43 countries, 60% of the world's population. The U.S. has a total of seven bilateral defense agreements around the world. Five of them are in Asia, uh, our, our alliance, treaty alliances with Japan, Korea, Australia, Thailand, and the Philippines. The Asia-Pacific region uh, accounts for over a third of U.S. trade and uh, a third of gross world product is uh, found in the Asia-Pacific region. More than one-third of the world's merchant fleet and one-half of its oil passes through Asian sea lanes, with the majority going through the South China Sea up to Northeast Asia. We're talking about a substantial 
uh, region of the world. I think you all know this uh, instinctively, but just to give a sense from those statistics, uh, just how much this region's stability and security is important for the global, uh, the global peace and development. So regional stability, free access to sea lanes and trade routes are essential to continued economic growth worldwide. The U.S. for 60 years has been the essential security guarantor of regional peace and stability uh, through a number of ways. The alliance system, as I mentioned, those five treaty alliances have been the, the pillars of that approach. Secondly is our regional presence, which when we talk about presence, it's more than the military, but uh, substantially uh, military, mostly in Japan and uh, South Korea. Uh, and of course, there are forces that we temporarily deploy in those places and, and other places in Asia, as well as stuff we pass through uh, the, the waters of, of Asia. All that encompasses U.S. presence, and I'll get to why that's important in a moment. Uh, Hawaii is the headquarters for this, but the forward deployment into Asia, Asia Pacific writ large, is important for reassurance of American commitments. Uh, now, we've been welcomed by the region as a benign presence uh, and a constructive presence. And we're there not just waiting to fight, but as a deterrent and active public good. And then we get to that. One key element, and this is important to understand, uh, particularly in Asia more than almost anywhere, is it's like a very delicate psychology in Asia. Uh, that if you talk to Asians, they may not talk about it openly, but it's extremely important. The maintenance of a balance of power. Um, there is no collective security arrangement in Asia like in Europe. In Europe, we have NATO. Everyone knows about NATO. It's all the countries of Europe coming together and common security. In Asia, we don't have that. We have a lot of tensions left over from history. We have uh, a lot of uncertainty. It's probably the most, and, and certainly to me, the most dynamic region in the world. And that dynamism brings opportunities, but tremendous challenges as we go. The tensions and suspicions remain among the nations, and you just very frankly look at them, whether it's China and Japan, Japan and Korea, China and Korea, uh, you look at the newspapers now, Thailand and Cambodia, uh, you can go down the list. There's still latent tensions and unresolved problems and conflicts in East Asia. The U.S. as a benign presence um, provides a certain balance, a certain reassurance of continuity in the mix of this change. Uh, we, of course, are a deterrent to the traditional challenges like North Korea and potentially a Taiwan scenario that's uh, open. Um, we also provide the space, uh, because of our reassurance, for CBMs, for the nations not to focus on arms races, but confidence building, confidence building measures. If we were not there, if we did not have the same system we have, there would be a vacuum into which others would, would place themselves. And in the face of rising major powers, China, India, Japan, Korea, even Indonesia, the uncertainty of a, of a security vacuum is, I think, uh, and they think as well in Asia, quite uh, dangerous for the stability. So we are valued. Our, our presence remains valued, remains welcome, and remains constructive. Uh, for, for Asia and all that I listed as far as uh, the contributions of Asia to the world economy and world development. Um, and I should say one last thing. Our presence forward is also um, important to be a first responder. You see almost every day, unfortunately, now, hurricanes, cyclones, tsunamis, humanitarian uh, disasters. And the United States is usually the first there, uh, aside from maybe local uh, uh, local uh, actors uh, within a country, we are usually the first responders and often the organizers. Uh, when asked, uh, when invited, we get there quickly. And in that way, we also do humanitarian work that's uh, far beyond simply um, waiting for war or waiting for conflict. We are there as a constructive uh, element. We also, of course, move quickly from the region to other places like Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so our forward deployment overcomes what we call now the tyranny of distance. It's a long, it's a long standing phrase, but the tyranny of distance, getting to places quickly uh, so that they don't fester uh, and we can, we can address the challenges in a timely fashion.